Adelaide versus Port Adelaide has always been kind of like a blockbuster game during the regular season, and it didn't disappoint in today's preseason game. In this episode, we're going to go over the players that did well in Supercoach and the ones that didn't. Joe, I think I saw the attendance record on the on the KO stream today, and it was like 5,000 people there. Mate, if you had 5,000 people at Arden Street, they're all the way down to the train station. Mate, it wasn't just a number. It was also the noise. I have mm-hmm. not seen such gusto over a preseason practice game. The fans, they are feral as always, honestly. It was amazing how they were getting stuck into the umpires. It was glorious to see. Um but it was a it was a ripping game, absolutely, as you say. And we've actually managed to get our first draw of the year. That's how close it was. Yep. Poor Adelaide and Adelaide drew 14 goals, nine behind a piece. This is after four quarters. They played for six, but we only care about the first four because that is where all of the AFL listed players were playing. In five and six, a few more of the Sandfall players got involved and they are obviously a lot less relevant. So well done to both of these teams. I thought this was the most entertaining of all the pre uh, all the preseason games thus far. Yeah, definitely. Same for me too. Uh, I wasn't a fan of the um, Adelaide jersey though. It looks a little bit like Hawthorne. I was like, why is Hawthorne playing twice today? But yeah, outside of that, just want to say as well, it seemed like a couple of players when we go over to the Port Adelaide side, did come out of the team like in the third quarter or just after. So maybe someone was being managed that way, but still a game. And as you say, Joe, I think I heard someone go for a tackle like, whoa, and then people yelling stuff at the umpires. And would it have been fun to be there? Like, this is what preseason's all about. Welcome to footy in Adelaide. 100%. It was like a country game almost, the way they were sort of just getting stuck into it. And you could hear them so loud and clear. It was hilarious. Um, and some people were yelling out encouragement. It, it was it was actually so much fun to listen to. Uh, the commentary was also really good as well. So shout out to those two guys. Um, mm-hmm. It was a good game. It was a good game all around. Um, both teams alternated in terms of having ascendancy. Um I think it started off with Adelaide going well, the Port doing well, then Adelaide, like it, it was an arm wrestle throughout the yep. entire day. No one kicked out too far for the other team to come back. It was such a wonderful game of football. And normally what we've seen in these preseason games is teams have been very scratchy, um, especially mm-hmm. with disposal. I honestly thought this was the highest uh, level, the highest caliber preseason game that we've had all preseason thus far. Um, and it was a great spectacle. So these guys are going to feature in finals, I reckon. Yeah, both teams as well, as long as Adelaide, you know, don't get some dodgy umpire decisions and see what happens. Um, See you both in September, really. Mate, they had the the umpire decisions in their favour very heavily at the start of the game, and we could hear the the crowd, the pro-Adelaide crowd, were, were getting slightly agitated. Um, mm-hmm. at the umpires there because of the early start for the Crows. I think the umpires had uh, felt some guilt over what happened last year, but it was a great game. We got to see all the best players um, out there, I think. It was a very solid outing. Both players had, uh, both teams had some great ball, uh, ball winners going head-to-head, obviously, as we know, with Adelaide, Laird, Dawson, mm-hmm. Crouch, and a couple of others that we were that we're really keen to talk about, um, and we'll talk about them in detail uh, in this next segment where we talk about the crows. I know you love segways, Joe. Let's talk about. That I love segways. Yeah, man, segways are my thing. If you don't know that Maya now, <laughs> you don't know me at all. Um, in fact, my segways, uh, you know. My delivery sort of hinges on the segways mm-hmm. very heavily. Yep. Um, Adelaide, so coming into this game, obviously we know that Adelaide defense is pretty depleted. No Nick Murray, no Jordan Butts. Obviously, Dode has gone. Some of the guys did step up, and one of them was Hinge, being kind of the, one of the older players now in that back line. Was doing a little bit of back line, maybe pushing up to the wing at times, but just really, really solid. And hopefully, yeah. Hopefully he came in and just is one of those players that potentially we can keep 
for the whole season. Um, did have some intercept marks, which is what we want, and we know the guy can jump and move in his mobile. So, yeah, I was pretty impressed. Just not really super coach, super relevant. I don't know if we're going to pick him over Hayden Young in our starting team, but down the track, it might happen, Joe. That's true. Absolutely. Um, really liked Hinge's game. Good ball user as well. Um, mm. I really rated his game. Really happy with what I saw from him. Uh, Dan Curtin, I think we're, we're, you know, so we're in agreements about Hinge, but Curtin sort of, we, I don't know. I wasn't a big fan of Curtin's game, to be honest. I definitely thought that he would be, he'd give us more. Mm. He only came into the game at like the end of the second quarter when he really came in, very quickly got a touch upon coming on the field. And he did, but I didn't really notice him until maybe the fourth quarter when he took another nice intercept mark. I don't know. I felt like he disappeared in that game. But you clearly, but you, you told me off air that you sort of like this kid's game. Yeah. I think maybe it was the fourth quarter stuff that we'd seen and when he started to get a bit more involved, it did feel like a little bit that he was potentially being load managed. You know, we've always heard about his preseason injuries, that kind of thing. You put him in for the full four quarters, it could be too much for this beginner level player. Um, one to definitely come and watch in the next game because we've all got Dan Curtin. Well, some people definitely do in their starting teams at Super Coach. The DPP is nice, obviously, early draft pick, all the hype of um, being such a good player and then playing defense in a depleted team every year. I say it, every single year, there's a player in. Adelaide defense, who's a young player who comes in and ends up being close to a premium level price, Dan Curtin could be that one for us. Michelini was last year. The year before that, I think it actually was Hinge. So is Dan Curtin that player or someone else potentially? Yes, it, it could be. He's got the DPP, which definitely helps. But mm -hmm. at that inflated price point, I don't know. He could play early on, especially given his um, the injuries that they got back there. but. I don't know. I just feel like he's going to be a slow burn, I think. Um, yeah. we'll and we already have know. Gipkiss. And we have Gipkiss at 150K, who's also probably going to be a slow burn, who showed in the past that in that role, he's capable of averaging 70. So I might want to put the money um, elsewhere, I think, with Daniel Curtin. Still, I'm happy to be convinced. Otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing him in the next week's game. So... Keep a close eye on him. We then move to the midfield. Rory Laird just doing Rory Laird things. Definitely mm -hmm. featured a lot of CBAs. Um, you know, everything that we know and love about him. Uh, we saw that on display. I think early on, he the, the real main rotation was Laird, Dawson, uh, Crouch, and then the other person would be like a Berry or a Rankin or a Rochelle. I definitely liked what I saw from Laird early on. There was a period of time in the third quarter where he was seen jogging along the boundary line. Um, not sure if he was just simply trying to shake something off or not, but he got back on the field in that third quarter anyway. So, um, you know, he loves to tackle. He loves a hug, Rory Laird. Yeah. If I go through these um, CBA percentages, right, O'Brien obviously main ruck 80%. And then next, and it really showed us this game that what, what they were looking to do with the team, and as opposed to some of the other games that we've reviewed today and the last couple of days, they didn't really have a lot of outs, which is what we wanted. Like, it's not like the dogs where, cool, Sanders gets 90% because Bont's not playing. You know what I mean? Whereas Adelaide was basically, everyone was there that should be there. So Laird, 70% CBAs is what we want. And then the next one down was Dawson with 46 so we know Rory Laird is basically just going to be that inside bull, going to be around the stoppage and be that player. Joe, Jordan Dawson was very, very good today. Very, very good. Um, I think in the intra-club game as well, Laird didn't play and then Dawson played and then did really well. But today, he just looks strong. And against the tough opposition, there's bragging rights in Adelaide, right? It's not a Melbourne thing where it's like, oh, cool, Essendon and St Kilda doesn't really matter. In Adelaide, if your team wins, you've got someone to talk about for the next couple of weeks and shut the other team up. So, yeah, it, it was very, very good um, from both of these mainstay people. Alongside a Crouch as well, who there was talk about a finger injury during the intra-club game. I didn't see any problem today. It, it was fine. He, he was a good player for them. He was. He was very good. It looked like that hand did not hinder him at all whatsoever. Um, 
I like that that he was here. He had some made some good decisions by foot, hitting up some good targets. And another thing that I really liked about his game today was the fact was the leadership that he presented. Mm -hmm. Like he was more than just simply being a player. Like he was when he was in a center bounce with Rankin. Um, not a center bounce, a stoppage. He was fully directing Rankin where he's supposed to position, where he's supposed to stand, and that's where Rankin went. And then it was a good thing that Rankin listened to him because coming from that play, Rankin then found himself inside forward 50 and kicked a beautiful goal from the boundary line. So Crouch was directing Rankin. He also directed, and right after that, went to the center bounce. Crouch was there, as was Barry, that guy next to him. And he mm -hmm. was, again, directing Barry where he's supposed to be about his positioning. So I really like Crouch more so than just the fact that he was playing, but also the leadership role that he was presenting and really taking an active step and helping those other teammates of his uh, where they're supposed to stand. And that, to me, I think just goes to show that he does feel like he belongs. He's been given the confidence um, that he's going to be in that main rotation, that he is going to be there as well to sort of help those other players go through. Mm -hmm. And there was a bunch of times where Laird and Dawson weren't in the center bounce, but it was just Crouch with Barry, with Rankin. So he's really taken that next step. He's no longer that guy that was left aside last year. It seems like he's really going to play in that role for the year. Right. That's a really good point you make there as well. And I think it, it, in, on another side, it really allows like a Dawson and a Laird to kind of dominate because they don't have to worry about the young kids. It's not like, cool, we can't focus on our opponent. We've got to say, hey, come over there, stand here, do this. Oh, wait, the ball's up. Now we have to run. Um, yeah, Crouch is, I'm tempted, Joe. I don't like to be tempted with Matt Crouch, but if he comes out and does another preseason game um, and I'm looking for a cheap midfielder, Chuck him in your team, I reckon. Uh, it is very another tempting. Another player that we flagged, I'm going to speak about someone else first. Another player that we really did flag as one of the two players who might be moving forward and then going into a midfield position is Isaac Rankin. He did very, very well today. Um, I was watching the um, the Gold Coast game, and I think a few players there have taken on his facial hair, uh, Ben King being one of them. I'm just trying to get that, you know, maybe that's his Samson, you know, cut the hair and then it works away. But, yeah, Rankin did very well, getting a lot of CBAs. And being that burst player with the good skills that we were looking for, we know how quick this guy is and how much of a trend in the AFL there really does seem to be putting a, like a Papley in the middle, for example, a Cameron in the middle. A lot of these clubs are putting like a small forward in there because they know that they can break out, even a Cozzy Pickett. For example, Rankin today got 46% CBAs. Like that, that second rotation right there, it, it was very, very good to watch. And, add something to this Adelaide team that they didn't really have last year. And he had double-digit clearances as well. He was nice. so clean. He was so clean and close. Uh, the athleticism, the balance, able to operate out of a phone box, and his connection with this guy, Rochelle. Rochelle, not entirely shy, Josh, they were on the same wavelength. These two guys mm -hmm. were bouncing off each other so incredibly well in the middle, pushing forward. They were a real headache. And a lot of times it might have been Rankin kicking it to Rochelle in the forward line or it might have been Rochelle kicking it to Rankin in the forward Like mm -hmm. these, it was so exciting, so dynamic. Um, and this is sort of what we knew. We'll, we'll, we were sort of anticipating that we're going to see more of that this year. And because of that, we weren't entirely sure what the midfield mix is going to look like for Adelaide we're in time, because there's now more people going through there. We don't know if they want to play more on the outside to facilitate this quick ball movement, mm -hmm. maybe less stoppage heavy. Um, it definitely looked different. It's not the same midfield that we've seen in the past. And you mentioned with Dawson, he only attended what 46% of CBAs. Then yep. he played a lot more. He played a lot of forward time. Um, if this sort of thing is going to carry forward, then dare I say it? <laughs> exactly. Imagine a Jordan Dawson DPP would be unbelievable Broken. if that was the case. Broken. Ridiculous. But yeah. don't get your hopes up too high. It was just one game, just a preseason game, but it worked really well. Mm -hmm. And you never know when something works well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
So fingers crossed, Adelaide have a lot of success with this current setup. Um, even giving a guy like Barry, for example, time on the ball. They've got so many people going through there. So many. Well, they, they have to put time into guys like Barry and Schoenmaker and a few of these others. Otherwise, they're going to start looking for more opportunities at different clubs. Um, they had a period of time before they got Rankin in, before they got Dawson in, where they were just drafting midfielders similar to a North Melbourne, trying to work out, hey, what was the mix, what we're going to do. And then as they start to develop these players, they get better, but they've brought in other guys via the trade period. Barry, I know there's been some injury concerns in the past, but 30% CBAs, Joe. Like, if, if we consider this is to be what they want to try and do, we'll have to wait for next week. But 30% CBAs is decent. At 226K, if you have to play a third player that's not a, like a midfielder, if you've got three rookies on field, I'd be more comfortable putting him on, on the midfield if he's locked in the best 22 versus some others. I wish this guy had forwards, a forward eligibility. Yes. Yes, that would be great. Someone with forward eligibility is Riley Philthorpe, someone that we've been speaking about every time we talk about Adelaide and what they need to take the mm -hmm. next step forward. It always involves this guy taking the next step in his career, and it looks like he has. He was fantastic tonight. He was great. He was pinching in the ruck. He was great on the lead. He was taking great marks. He was hitting the scoreboard. He was doing it all, and he was doing it with confidence, with assertiveness. He wasn't being timid and meek. He was crashing. He was even crashing packs. I was blown away by Riley. I thought his game mm -hmm. was actually better than Darcy Fogarty's, and that's probably the first time I've ever said that because Fogg is a great player. But Riley's game today? Well done, son. If this is what we're going to see in the in the in 2024, geez, Adelaide, watch out. Him, Tex, Fog, my word, that's tough. Yeah, we'll probably end up doing a breakout players of the season. Who needs to step up at your club? And Phil Thorpe's the one for them. I think it's finally time, you know, number one draft pick. I think it's finally time when it's his chance. And with Tex Walker getting older, with O'Brien kind of settling in and you know what you're going to get out of that player. Phil Thorpe is the one. He's been penciled for it every year, as you say, Joe. Time to step up, mate. And another player who stood up really well and uh, was by far and away the number one ruckman of the night, Riley, Riley mm -hmm. O'Brien. Rob, he, he gave he gave Sweet and Soldo an absolute bath today. I mean, it's like, not hard to be um, number one ruck when you've played for the whole season versus two guys that are competing for a spot in the team. So you know what you're going to get. Um, well, that's it, right? Um, Riley O'Brien is a weird one because he's always set for kind of that 95 to 100 average in super coach. Um, really solid player. Kind of reminds me of Goldstein, but Goldstein's probably a little bit more mobile and O'Brien's probably a little bit more reach and, and hit that way, but not as mobile. So yeah, just a really solid Ruckman. Like you don't need to spend a million dollars on a Ruckman. Ugo with like a Max Gorn or a Grundy or a Sean Darcy. Pick yourself a Riley O'Brien. You're doing okay. 100% because he's he's a workhorse and he did really That's well amazing. going back behind the back behind the play, plugging the holes, taking some intercept marks. Mm. Well done, Rob. We give you your kudos and your props today because that's what we do. We like to shout out the players who we think on the surface are a little bit underappreciated. It's more than just super coach. It's about the love of the game. And Rob, we loved your game tonight. Well done, mate. Definitely. We then yeah, move on to talk about the Port Adelaide power. Stay tuned. And now these are your Port Adelaide Power players, starting off with Dan Houston. I know a lot of people oh. have seen his early run, have seen him playing a lot at home. Seven out of the first nine is playing at home. People anticipate he's going to iron out those inconsistencies in his scoring. He's not going to be the burn man anymore. What do you reckon? Were you, were you convinced otherwise? I love me some Dan. I hate this player so much, but I love me some Dan Houston. Like, if he was 30K cheaper, get in my team automatically, I think I'd figure out. Just his averages there, but he listening to the commentators, 
he's just their man off halfback. Like, that's the position he plays. He's missed to fix it across the ground, but really used as that distributor um, type player off the off the back line. And we know where his scoring comes from. I think it might just be a favoritism towards um, Adelaide Oval, and they do have a lot of very early games there. I think it's like seven of the, the first eight, which isn't to be, like, discounted, right? Like, that's a lot of scoring. If he's averaging 114 at that ground, like that puts him up to 650k. So it's very, very good. Dan Houston, though, Joe. I hate holding grudges, but got a bit of a grudge against him. Not gonna lie. I don't have any grudges against him personally. But for me, I'm not entirely convinced on this pick. I know I probably should have I should hold the grudge considering that he broke my heart last year. But mm-hmm. um I, you know, kudos to him. He sunk that kick magnificently well after the siren. But for me, the reason why I'm not picking him is because, to be honest, I thought these two guys next to him, yep. I saw them more than I saw him. Like, but, but I, I saw a lot. Style. That's his style. Yeah. Like, he just ends up with 250 super coach points. And it like, looks like he's had three touches, but ends up he's ter- had like 35. And you just don't see him on field. Maybe, but in my eyes, it looked like Farrell was Mm -hmm. um, maybe not more than Houston, probably about the same amount of points, but really more than anything, I thought this guy had a really great game. This guy almost, every time I saw a kick-in, I thought it it seemed to be Ryan Burton, like on kicking duties. Uh, And he kicked a couple of goals from outside 50, like no one's like no one's business. It, it was so easy. He looked to be the main distributor for for Port for a lot of the night. I honestly thought Houston was playing a lot higher up the ground. Burton was playing behind the play. I I really liked Burton's game, dare I say. I liked his game more than Houston's game. So plus the two goals on top of that, him going up the ground. Every time I look, I'd see this number three. The ball was number three's hands. It's like, bloody hell. I had to look it up. Like, is this really Burton? Yeah, it's really Burton. So, I don't know. I'm keeping a close eye on this one um, very closely. It's I don't know if it, all this extra scaling goes Houston's way, but mm-hmm. into my eyes, I really like Burton. Yeah, he definitely did really have a good game. Um, it seems like Port Adelaide at the moment are trying to figure out what their backline mix is, especially with bringing in two more, like, key defenders. So it sucks for like BZT and Radigalia that now they've kind of gone a bit shorter and now it's cool. You've been relegated to the VFL. Hey, you know, so I mean, it's not VFL, it's handful, but Port Alley want to leave, I'll, I'll, you know, the story. Um, Ryan Burton did look very impressive. There's a reason why they poached him from Hawthorne or was part of the Chad Warner, so um, Chad Wingard trade that kind of worked out well in their favor. So maybe he's that player that they desperately need off halfback Joe. Um, I know Josh Sin kind of played a little bit of that halfback role as well um, in, in the game and was impressive, but just didn't come on for the whole game. He actually, you know, later on in the in the fourth quarters. Yeah, he came on. And, yeah, Josh Sin came in the fourth quarter, um, which is obviously very late in the piece. Didn't feature in the first three, which is where all the fun stuff really took place. Obviously, mm-hmm. the fourth quarter was also AFL listed players, but for him to have only played one quarter goes to show that he's definitely pretty low in the picking order. Um, it's pretty similar to like a Matt Roberts, for example, from the Swans, not as high up as we thought he would be. Um, yeah. So keep still keep an eye on him. You never know. He might play. Um, someone that you couldn't take your eyes off was this guy, Zach Butters. He's just, just the classiest of movers, just silky and... He just oozes and just waltzes all over the ground, and he's almost nonchalant in the way he plays. It's it's ridiculous. He will just do that little that little thing with his shoulders and the ball under his hand, like a little bit of a shimmy sort of thing, you know, we'll go one way that way, and then mm-hmm. he'll just do this nice little casual death yep. touch kick over the top into space and hit his target. It's he's a joy to watch, Zach Butters. Uh, he honestly should be a lock. Um, Everybody. How many, with the early how many own him? I want to see. Especially with that not guy. Not that much. I think he's he's one of the most owned, um, but it's not going to be that much being like 630K. 
yeah, 30, 35% seems about right. Um, if we look at the CBAs kind of going through there, wines had the most at 63%, which is a lot. Um, Butters, 53. Horn Francis, 53. Not a fan, but okay. Um, Mead, Rosie had about 50 odd each as well. And then like the Ruckman. So yeah, we can kind of gauge a little bit what their midfield looks to be like and who's going to be first rotation and second rotation. Zach Butters is going to win them games this year. Um, if you don't have him in your team, what are you doing? And the early buy is basically, sorry, no early buy and then round 13 buy is just another reason why you should have him in there. Like, it's just silly not to. Yep, exactly. Very silly. Um, how many CBAs does Connor Rose have? Sorry? Uh, 50. 50%. 50%? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it's something that we flagged in our preseason video of hey guys who potentially might be able to get DPP. Um, Jordan Dawson maybe we didn't say that in the previous one, but we definitely had Connor Rosie on there, and we saw periods of time where he was featuring in the forward line and kicking goals, and then later on when Butters and the other guys went out, he went and back to his midfield role as kind of that person that would steal the ball and and run through. So yeah, this captain goes everywhere. And hopefully he goes into our forward line, maybe round seven. Ooh, very exciting. Very exciting. Keep spots in there for Connor Rosie. Uh, Ollie very Wines, much. as you mentioned, had the most CBAs uh, over there of the midfielders for Port Adelaide. Thought he had a decent game, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't think he was overly impressive, but definitely was in and under in the clinches. Um, he is cheaper than the crouch by about $30,000, which yeah. I definitely think I preferred Crouch's game over Wines' game, to be honest. Mm. Um, I don't know. That could be subjective. Let me know in the comments down below what you think. Did you prefer Wines? Did you prefer Crouch? Personally, I preferred Crouch because I think Crouch was better by foot as well, exiting from D50. I didn't see much of that from Wines. Um, I know some people yeah. were contemplating him, but for me, he's a no. It's just that early buy and historically how much better he scores when he plays at home. Um, that's really, really, really tempting for a lot of people, including myself. If Wines comes out and just all preseason is, Ollie Wines is fit, all preseason, and we know how good he scores at that at that ground. I think he's like a 120 average at home. If he's scoring 120 for seven of the, the first eight games, like there's his money and his increase. Um, it's a bit scary. True. A bit sketch, but the reduced money versus like, let's say, cool, I don't want to pick a Brayshaw. I want to get an Ollie Wines who might jump up to 550, 600 if you're very lucky at a small point in time. Offload him. You can do a lot with that 150K. So, yeah, see what happens, I think. I don't think he goes 120, though, when it's him, Horn Francis, Boke, Butters, Rosie. Maybe not. Mead was going through there quite a bit as well. I don't know. I think there's too many chefs in the kitchen. I can't mm -hmm. see 60% CBAs translating to 120 super coach, but only time will tell. Keep your eyes open. Keep an open mind as well. Um, I know you weren't a big fan of Jason Horn Francis. Um, I'm going to call him Francis because you're not a fan, but I was a fan. He was very good, um, very dynamic. He started forward to start mm -hmm. the game. Um, and then as the game went on, started to feature a lot more in the midfield. Classic penetrating run and kick um, imposed himself in the contest probably from the second quarter onwards uh, and got quite a few free kicks for high contact because he's just putting his body over the ball um, and earning free kicks the hard way. So was a big fan of Horn Francis, so well done to him. Um I just wouldn't go there for super coach though. I don't know. Again, similar to a wines, there's just so many chefs in the kitchen and they're going to be alternating between forward and midfield. If they had less players in that midfield, then I'd be a lot more keen to start him. But because there's so much to share, I, I personally, at this point in time, don't see myself doing it. Yeah. And that's the big thing, right? If, he gets DPP because, as you say, spent some time forward. He's only locked in at the moment for 50% CBAs. Cool. You can probably pick him up and it might be a 500K forward for us. Um, yep. As a, as a pure midfielder, I don't think he's ready yet. 
there's a reason why he was picked at pick one. Like, as much as I hate him because of all the stuff with his dad and moving over to Port Adelaide and whatever, we got Sheasel and Wardle out of it. So I'm happy with that. Um, but he is a good player. Um, he's quick. He's powerful, and he has a good precise, like, bullet kicks as well, which is kind of what we saw a little bit from today's game. So, as you say, Joe, not super coach relevant yet. Potentially down the line when a Ollie Wines and a Boke and all these guys retire, might be him, Rosie Butters, but for this year, no. Yeah, did look and time. you mentioned this guy. Um, he's not far from retiring. Um, no, just wanted this year, to... probably. Last yeah. chance. He's... Exactly. Just wanted to salute him. I thought he also had a good game, um, was really handy in transition from D50 to forward 50 um, in the chains as well. So, um, and great hit up in the in, in kicks inside 50. So, um, even at this age, ultimate professional, a salute to you, Travis Boak. Well done. You've done a sensational job um, as a servant of your club for, and as well as raising the next generation. Um, who are really flourishing underneath you. So mm -hmm. hopefully you have a great career this year, have a great way to end it all off. I can't see it going moving forward for the betterment of the team. Definitely needs more time into Horn Francis, into Wines, into Butters and Rosie. So well done, Boki. Giving you a shout out here. Um, and some of the youngsters that we're talking about, Meaty, I kept hearing in the crowd, yes, go Meaty. Yep. Uh, yep. He was great. He was great. We're getting blessed with some of these um, nice DPP midfield selections as well. I know we've been very hot on just picking Sanders and um, Sanders and McKercher, but guys like him could really start to feature in our forward line. If he's going to play a lot of mid-time, he's going to start scoring well. Next week is the big test because next yes. week is when we can really gauge his disposal efficiency against his super group score. We could be playing Flanders and five 200K rookies in our forward line, Joe. Maybe Flanders, Billings, and then and then four others, and then have a few yeah. other guys on field or, and on the bench who are a little bit more expensive because we're blessed this year. Last year was the the mid price madness. This year it could be the two hundred k rookie madness. It could very well be, and it's not mad though because this guy no. attended CBAs. Um, he was percent, fifty three percent. More, more of than Rosie had more CBAs than Rosie. Who got go. and admittedly Rosie got more CBAs because um Butters left at the end of the third quarter. So yeah. but Meade, he was in it. Um he was very impressive. I loved his spread from the center bounce. I loved his pressure. Um his kicks inside 50 were also very dangerous. And I, I was like watching the game, I'm like, wow, this guy is such a dynamic player. Um I reckon this guy's best 22. And they were fielding their best team when he got that many mm. CBA. So clearly they do rate this kid really highly. And I could tell the fans as well, um, every time he was on the ball, I could hear someone in the crowd go, go, Meaty, go, yeah, Meaty. And so, like, I, I knew who it was because the crowd was telling me who it was every time he got the ball. So that was, you know, when you're, when you're that beloved um, mm. and there's that much hype around you, I guess that just is a good reflection of your talent, I suppose, and the optimism that your team has for you. So, mate, uh, if he does well next week, yo, this dude's going to be in my team. I'm Locking really in. confident about that. Probably not in the in the midfield, but definitely as a forward option. Um, you can go one cheaper and just pick, you know, save some, save some cash up somewhere else and grab me. But you could also pay up a little bit. Like if you have a Finn McRae, who yep. didn't really take his opportunity in that match sim against you guys. Uh, with all those players missing, he still didn't dominate. He still didn't shine. And so he might be sub-risk. He might not necessarily be best 22. So you might find somewhere an extra 40000 to pay up and get Jackson Mead in, who mm -hmm. appears to be best 22. Um it could be worthwhile with DPP, with no early buy as well. There's a lot of boxes being ticked by this kid. So um, definitely keep an eye out on him the same way we keep keeping an eye on Josh Sin, the same way we're keeping an eye on Jordan Sweet. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm glad we know now. I'm glad we haven't been, like, sucked in into picking him as an R3 and then just stuff not working out. Soldo's the number one. 
Soldo left. Sweet and Vicentini took over the spot afterwards. Sweet thought it was a good idea to try and have a punch on with Riley O'Brien. It didn't work out very well. It is like scuffled on the floor and yeah, you should have come to a different club, mate, because you're, you're stuck and you're back to playing reserves again, unfortunately. So yeah, um, not much to say there. Soldo is number one. Sweet is number two, but they don't play number twos. So yeah, see you next year, maybe. Or when someone has Sweet. a injury. Sweet is a number two, if yeah. you know what I mean. Uh, definitely Soldo on top. Sam Powell Pepper. Just a shout out to him. He's not super coach relevant, but I just love the way this guy goes about it. He just He's goes not round one relevant either. He's not round one relevant because he is going to be suspended. The piece of sniping son of a how could he do that? How could he do that? I normally love it when he plays, but when he that what he did today was very disappointing. Sam Powell Pepper, I am very salty with you. Mm hmm. I understand too. And then Judd McKinty is the last one there up on the list, Joe. Why is he in our list? Let the fans know. I like this kid. He played really, really well. Um, he, he's got great ground level, um, I suppose, mobility, some great pressure on the ball. He was a great user of the football as well. Um, he wasn't very prolific. He didn't. I don't think he got a lot of the disposals, a lot of the ball, but mm -hmm. when he did, he did good things with it. So uh, I was really, really, really pleased with his game, if the words would come out. It's 11.20 p.m., as you can tell. So we are putting in the hard work very much here, guys. Very, very hard work um, on a Friday night. So please, please like what we have to say. Um, but, yeah, Jed McKenzie, really pleased with him. Keep an eye out, an eye out for him uh, next week's game. I uh, think he could be one of those mid-prices that could make their way into our side because there's no early buy if mm -hmm. the other ones fail, if a harms looks like crap, if a Billings looks like he's stuck on a wing and not getting used a lot, or if, you know, regardless, if, if a Nat 5, or should I say when a Nat 5 breaks down, um, McKenty probably could be a good backup option as well, I think. And with that, guys, was our discussion, our deep dive of the draw between Port mm -hmm. Adelaide and the Adelaide Crows after four quarters in South Australia in a mini showdown, or is it a derby? I forgot which one is which. Which one is Adelaide? Which one is which one is West, Western Australia? Which one is South Australia? But it was a showdown, I think, um, between the two of them. So please let us know in the comments down below if you liked what we had to say and also if there were any players that we didn't talk about that you would like us to talk about. Guys, remember we've got our Super Coach group, our Super Coach League out as well, where you guys can win three amazing prizes. First prize, AFL jersey of your choice, just like Joe's got in the background, but a real one, not a picture. Um, second prize is a two AFL voucher, two AFL tickets. For any games yes. for next year. Two AFL tickets for any game. Not AFL vouchers. We're not that rich yet. Um, and then an AFL voucher as well, where you guys can buy anything you want from the shop. The link, the video for that, the way to you know jump on there in the description below. Yeah, you can tell it's very late when we're recording this video. We are absolutely fumbling and stumbling <laughs> our way through this and through this outro. We also have a tipping competition as well that we've recently started. So head on over. The link will be in the comments down below, in the description down below as well, in relation to how you can join that. And if you win, you get a $50 AFL store voucher as well, which is obviously very fun, all for free. Free is good. The more free things we have, please give us more. Definitely. Check out our other videos. We've gone through all the teams. There's just one more left for tomorrow, which is West Coast versus Frio. And then next week, they've got all the other games happening as well. We're going to have our community team dropping soon as well, Joe. So stay tuned for that video. It's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure you guys, you subscribe, hit that notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our videos that you can be up to date and join us uh, every step of the way, hopefully not at 11.23 p.m. Um, because here at the Centre Bounce, we do the hard work so that you do not have to. Bye for now.